Good morning, happy 2022. I am Margaret Latimer, Vice President and Provost at the Germantown campus and for the college-wide STEM unit. It is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you to the spring opening meeting on behalf of the Vice Presidents and Provosts. I want to extend a special welcome to those of you who have just joined Montgomery College. For a moment, I thought we were really going to be able to do this in person, mingle, masked, and safely distance, then take our seats in Globe Hall. I was going to pick two lucky winners to take a free ride in the new elevator in HT. Alas, we will Zoom in the semester safely, healthily, and with a near zero carbon footprint. It aligns so nicely with the theme, embracing change. I know that some of you are thinking that you've already embraced change. You've given it a bear hug during these past two years. But the times, they are changing. May I recommend a course in calculus? Calculus is, of course, the mathematical study of continuous change, the study of delta, a different delta, or a course in philosophy. Heraclitus gave us the concept of flux, of waters in a river changing, always flowing, much like life around us, which leads me to suggest a physics course and another Greek letter. Change, of course, is inevitable and abundant. We will continue to embrace it as we stay rooted in our mission, vision, and values, and as we spread our wings and soar into the future. We will be catalysts for change that supports our students and makes Montgomery College the best community college in the country. And we will support each other, as we have done throughout the pandemic. Building the next normal, as the bumper sticker says, why be normal? We will be better than normal as we build the future of the college and the county this spring and beyond. Now, I invite your attention to view the video with a few of the college's highlights from the past semester. We have to be the change that we want to see. And I think many of us here today want our community and our nation to restart some important dialogues about race, equity, and opportunity. Our community, all around us, and including us, are learning to live with this virus, and we cannot lose sight of the priorities that still need our attention to propel our students forward. We have kept our planning process active and our fiscal measures strategic. Challenges remain, enrollment is just one of them. Completion does not happen without community. To learn together, to grow, to be in a student organization together, to build their civic engagement. That's what this building means. And so it's much more than the brick and mortar. It's literally helping create community for these students, which will help make Montgomery County, our state, and our region, and our country strong. I hope this beautiful building send a powerful message. You are welcome here. It's real world. It brings students into a situation in which uh, they are mimicking real life decisions that they would have to make as a business person. I am so very honored to have been selected by the Board of Trustees to serve as the college's next president. Montgomery College has long been a leader among community colleges nationally, and I'm excited to be joining the ranks at this time of change and great urgency. Welcome to the spring semester. 
you know there is something normalizing about these meetings. Even in the midst of so much uncertainty, they remind us in a way that the work that we do goes on. We must gather ourselves in whatever form necessary in the moment to serve students and our community. As you can see, we're taking some extra precautions, reducing our numbers, masking diligently, taking our health assessments daily, and where possible, giving each other physical space. I review the, da the data related to the COVID variant and how it's impacting Montgomery College. I know we are the most vaccinated community in the state of Maryland, and we rank across the top in, in the country. I know that our reports are significantly lower than our brother and sister agencies because we are doing at Montgomery College what we committed to do. I read the reports that the metropolitan region is leveling off relative to positive cases. I wear my mask as required, and I, along with the senior leadership, take very seriously the concerns that we receive, both those that are communicated directly, those that arrive by email, and those that are articulated by our committees. When I arrived here at Montgomery College, I was told unequivocally that Montgomery employees agreed to have data and science guide our actions. I have been true to that commitment and will remain so while I serve as interim president. We continue to be good community partners. Our campuses have been hosting sites for testing, vaccinations, and boosters. And I want to thank all of you, Montgomery College, 97% of you are fully vaccinated and either have already taken your booster or you're lining up to do so. 3% applied for exemptions and are testing weekly. 72% of our students have uploaded their vaccination cards. Some are applying for exemptions as well. As you may have heard, we have a, a state mass testing site set up on the Germantown campus another sign of how vital we are to the greater community and its needs. I want to thank all of the employees who are working hard on that project. If we haven't learned anything from the pandemic, and as you know, we've learned a lot, we know that change is constant. We all know that, on, that in our own lives, we all know that in our own lives, but in the last 20 months, there has been little reprieve from this reality. Almost every aspect has been altered by the pandemic, which in some cases has been tiring. We've lived on a roller coaster of hope about the next phases. Our expectations went up with the creation of vaccines and then Delta arrived. Then we, our expectations went back up again as we talked about boosters and then Omicron arrived. The uncertainty with which we live daily is stressful on a personal level, certainly, but it has tested us as an organization as well. Adaptability is a challenge for any large institution, but the number of adaptations that we have required to make has been extraordinary. As you know, the college has pivoted successfully in several key components of our academic and service offerings. We've created components of our processes to confirm student and employee vaccinations. We have adapted health protocols to respond to changing local conditions. We have worked with our unions to understand their members' concerns, which are also our concerns. And all the while, several of our scorecard measures of student success have improved. So part of embracing change is expecting it and meeting it where it is. These days we plan with the expectation that things will change, be it a new variant, a snowstorm as we have experienced over the last two weekends, or a supply chain backlog. Our entire existence is adaptation. And while this feels hard, it also strengthens us as an organization. So how do we successfully meet change where it is? First, the planning that was done years ago is serving the college in ways we could not have predicted. The growth of online degrees, the push for more philanthropy to support struggling students, 
the expansion of community engagement and the deepening of radical inclusion have positioned the college better in this moment than it could have been. The college's academic support programs, such as Achieving Collegiate Excellence and Success and Achieving the Promise Academy, created new touch points for students, which have been critical in this pandemic environment. Elite's work in supporting employee trainings and its push for technology skills have served us incredibly well. Very few of us were thinking about a pandemic when we made, those, when we made these kinds of opportunities priorities. Today, however, they have proved essential to our ability to serve students. If there is any lesson to be learned, it is that planning matters even more. There can be an impulse to put planning on the back burner when we feel overwhelmed by the day-to-day -day demands, but planning has allowed us to continue to thrive in a time of great change. In the video we just saw, the Long Nguyen and Kimmy Dong Student Services Center and the Macklin Business Institute's newly opened finance lab, these projects were years in the making. The planning that went into the funding, the design and construction was complex and collaborative. And that's why big projects require time and energy that often goes on behind the scenes. I'll share another example. When the county executive asked us to explore the possibility of a new campus in East County two years ago, it seemed like a distant idea. Our work on the project overlapped with the start of the pandemic and the search for a new president. So there was a lot going on, but the college prioritized our commitment to East County and produced an extraordinary convincing and detailed study we began pushing ahead with next steps. The project is still in process, but the goal is to make a difference for underserved residents in East County, many of whom have been impacted by economic conditions created by this new normal. Obviously, we didn't see these circumstances coming, but we were planning for a future that empowers people in need, and it is coming to fruition at just the right time. Another way in which we have continued planning is fiscal sustainability. Again, some of our early fiscal prudence and very careful planning left us with a fund balance which kept us from falling short when the, when the pandemic hit in the spring of 2020. And then we faced enrollment declines, not just in the last three semesters, but in the last several years. Even with the federal funding to shore up some losses we face new expenses, retrofitting HVAC systems, technology upgrades, new software purchases, and vendors for vaccine records and confirmations. We also lost a good deal of expected revenue from auxiliary services, theater rentals, food sales, and some specialized programs. Deliberate attention to all of our expenses and robust collaboration across the college kept these costs from impacting our most important asset, you, our people. Planning kept us solvent and able to protect, protect our faculty and staff during the worst of times. It got us where we are today, and it is continuing as we face an enrollment drop of nearly 14% this past fall. While we know that colleges across the nation are experiencing similar impacts, ours is on the higher side and we are all working tirelessly to address it. So we are watching this carefully and planning for contingencies at the same time. Planning matters now more than ever. The second way of meeting change is with innovation. That term is a bit overused, so I'll just call it creativity. Empowering students to continue to succeed has meant some hard scrabble on the job workarounds. Those who connect with students academically have had to create new ways to convey content in virtual settings and to build strong, face, strong relationships in face-to-face -face instruction, despite masks and social distancing. Those who serve students in financial aid and enrollment have had to navigate some of the same challenges, creating bridges that reach over the gaps that emerged during the worst of times. Faculty, ACES coaches, ATPA coaches, 
librarians, tutors have all innovated to reach students where they are so that they have the tools they need to thrive. Facilities and public safety have had to create solutions to brand new challenges and to improve health and safety with, method, with methods that fit our specific buildings and our infrastructure. We have all responded in whatever role we feel to the new needs that we face every day. The urgency of meeting these changes has required us to be pioneers in a, of a sort. We're adjusting on the fly to altered circumstances, sometimes literally overnight, and I can attest to that. Again, this may feel stressful, but it has built a collective muscle that will serve the college as we move ahead. For years before the times in which we find ourselves, the future of higher education was framed around agility, flexibility, and connected tightly to workforce needs. I can't think of another time in which colleges have had to respond with more timeliness to employment needs that were changing more quickly and with less predictability than right now. And the final element of meeting change successfully at the college is, is protecting the vulnerable. This is pretty instinctive for us at Montgomery College. We've been fortunate in distributing $24.5 million in federal funding to students in need of emergency assistance over the course of the last several years. We also have a new grant from the U.S. Department of Education worth close to a million dollars. It is for the Student Health and Wellness or the Shaw Center for Student Success to provide social resource programs for our students. And our philanthropy efforts have yielded some extraordinary results as we saw in the video and as the Leggett Building demonstrates. So as many of you know, our new Presidential Scholars Program is moving forward and will provide even more support to students facing some of the greatest obstacles. In concert with our deliberate anti-racism work, this program will lift up students who have been underserved in the past. It is an example of one of my favorite mantras, be the change that you want to see. Our student success scorecard shows that we've been doing this for seven years now, and our efforts are bearing fruit, even during the pandemic. Students are achieving more in several metrics than ever. In many ways, we are already embracing change and flourishing if you continue to look at our long-term goals. Enhancing transformational teaching and learning, check. Driving economic mobility, check. Empowering students to succeed, check. I won't name them all, but they are still guiding our strategic decisions and our strategic work. So as we build a new normal, we are undoubtedly meeting change as it comes. We are also managing some tough realities of this new normal. We have increased competition from online higher education providers and an empl and employment market that is being reshaped almost monthly. A significant drop in enrollment, financial challenges to students who have lost wages and jobs, families who may need their students to care for children or seniors. There is a new vulnerability in our world, not just in health, but in financial stability for families. There remains an unpredictability in job markets and supply chains that makes it sometimes seem impossible to rely on much of what we have come to believe was true. Where students formerly enrolled in higher numbers when jobs were scarce, that dynamic has been upended. We are witnessing low enrollments and unstable employment markets. The pandemic e economic is a new reality, and much like everyone else, we are still learning its behavior. Academic affairs is pivoting class formats as needed. They shifted about 5% more classes to structured remote just two weeks ago when enrollment was trending higher in that modality. Marketing has people on the phones calling students who have visited our website but have yet to enroll. Student Affairs is contacting students who have registered but have yet to pay to help them make arrangements. All of this is happening while the offices of administrative and fiscal services leads efforts to improve, to improve health conditions 
through air quality assessments, PPE provisions, and student and employee vaccinations. There is so much activity at the college today that I can't capture it all. But what I can do is say that we are continuing to push forward the priorities that might not feel urgent, but have undeniable impacts. Comprehensive advising, data governance, and strategic workforce planning, among others. What I know is that the leadership team has been tireless at engaging many of you about the challenges that we're facing communally. We are in constant communication with the Board of Trustees and the executive and legislative branches of county government. It has worked collaboratively and consistently since my arrival at Montgomery College in August of 2021. Over the holiday break and up to this point today, I believe that leaders set examples. Like all of you, I am present physically a minimum of four days a week. I signed up to call students to encourage them to consider Montgomery College, to register, to upload their vaccination cards. And concurrently, I refer them to services where they can be supported as they navigate the enrollment processes. And as we talk about share our thoughts and truly embrace a new normal, Montgomery College will do so with a new leader at the helm, Dr. Jermaine Williams. Dr. Williams has deep experiences, a dynamic vision, and a profound commitment to the values that we already hold dear. He has shown himself to be a bold and courageous advocate for equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. He is a consistent champion for the underserved. The Board of Trustees could not have found a better match for the needs of the college than Dr. Williams. That's why he's joining us today to talk about where he comes from, what he brings to the college, what you can expect from him, and what potential he sees here in this critical moment for higher education. Dr. Williams, welcome to Montgomery College, and thank you so much for being here with us today. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. Well, you know, I've heard you talk at length about higher education as a public good and a powerful bridge to opportunity. It's a fulcrum for individual achievement and to collective community growth. I've heard you articulate that in several settings, including at the Aspen Institute. And as you know, you and I met at the Aspen Institute just about three years ago now. And you're joined by several colleagues here at Montgomery College who've also had that experience. Dr. Steve Kane, Dr. Monica Brown, and now Dr. Sanjay Rai. So I'd like to ask you a few questions and then you can certainly share with us as you will. What attracted you to the presidency of Montgomery College? What was important about this institution that you could see yourself here. Absolutely, well thank you again, uh, Dr. Dukes. It's such a pleasure to be here. And um, there, there are so many things that attracted me to Montgomery College. And I think of a, you know, a, a few of the, the salient components, you know, really the dedication to being student-centered. Um, I can see that in the MC 2025 plan, uh, along with the, the student-centered approach, it's also the commitment to the faculty and staff and the communities that the college serves. So um, that was uh, truly remarkable and something that drew me. Uh, there's also, you know, Montgomery College being at the nexus of education, workforce, technology, and innovation based on where it's situated and everything that it has done, both educationally and through support services. Um, looking at that innovation and transformation and contribution to the communities, again, was uh, another focal point and something that drew me and I would say, because um, I know our time is limited, I would say the last piece I would hit on is um, really the, uh, the, the ever evolving and bold commitment to social justice, racial equity, um, to an embracing an anti-racist framework that's driving the college both now and into the future that I've seen the Board of Trustees commit to and I've seen plans for how that's embedded and will be embedded throughout the college. Those are 
some of the primary drivers that really drew me to this fantastic institution. And you know, as you, as you say that, I think about the fact that, that Dr. Pollard, our immediate past president, was also served as, serves as a mentor in the Aspen yes. Institute. And so many times as she talked to all of you who were aspiring presidents or rising presidents, that um, she, was, she was just certainly bold in her stance about the role that Montgomery College had taken on and how it, sees it, how it saw itself as a leading institution around the work of anti-racism and, and what she termed radical inclusion. Yes. So um, it's, it's clear that those things resonated with you even as you listen to her in the settings where we had the opportunity to do so. So can you, given all of that, can you talk about um, a few of the challenges that you see facing higher education today and where and how those challenges might impact the college? Absolutely, and um, it's, you know, you've highlighted them very articulately and, and I would share from my reflection is, you know, the enrollment and pathways to progress, right? And we know that in, enrollment is something that is, you know, really impacting all community colleges nationwide. At the same time, I think looking at the, not only incoming students, but their matriculation throughout the college and then their pathway to progress, right? Linking that and ensuring that every student has an ability to leave with a credential of economic value that leads to a family sustainable wage, social mobility, and positively impacts the, the workforce, right? The, the regional needs. I think that is a, that's a, a challenge. And as you and I both know, we frame challenges as opportunities. So when I mention these challenges, I see them also as opportunities and I see so much of the great work that's been done at Montgomery College to already uh, address these challenges. So I think that is um, definitely one of, the, one of the biggest challenges. And along with that is, it's the quick changing and the evolving economy and the workforce, right? And what the demands are. You know, the jobs now are not going to be the same as the jobs maybe in, in three months. I mean, if we look at the supply chain situations, we look at what's happening with you know, work from home, we look at all of these um, new professional opportunities that are arising um, as we progress as a society very quickly. So how do we take the challenge of redesigning what we're offering by working with K through 12, business and industry, four-year institutions, and develop these purposeful educational opportunities that again are, are leading to you know, social mobility for, for our students. And I would say um, one of the other, the biggest challenges that we face in higher education are the racial and social injustices. Uh, I, don't, I think that needs to be threaded throughout every conversation that we have. And you'll hear me probably uh, embed that within every response to every question because it is that important, right? We, can't, we cannot other um, racial and social injustices. They need to be within the framework of every single conversation. But we have a, a, a great opportunity to address and you know, institutions like Montgomery College have been addressing these issues for quite some time and are boldly doing that into the future. So, so as, as, you, as you were talking, what I'm thinking about is that in order to, to, to address these things to, and to do it soundly and as in your words, boldly, you have to be able to talk to folks, to, yes. to see, to understand their perspectives. Yes. Most people would ask the question, what is your leadership style? <laughs> I ask the question, how do you lead? And I lead through, and I appreciate that question. I lead through inclusion. Um, I lead through trying to find out, you know, how things work. I lead through conversing with people and constituency groups. I, I ask, I, I lead through questions. <laughs> I, ask, I ask a lot of questions, not because I have a particular value on something one way or the other, but I want to genuinely understand the perspectives of individuals. I want to understand how programs, initiatives, policies work from, from their perspective, what their lived experiences are, right? So I can move past um, sympathy, past empathy towards actual compassion, to actually taking all that information and, and acting on it. So I'm extremely inquisitive. I try and be um, very mindful of everyone around and what their perspectives are because I think having all that information leads us to really dynamic responses to 
complex questions. And let's face it, we have a lot of complex questions that we're trying to address. So how do you respond to um, external critics who question the value of post-secondary education? And I, um, I lean on the positives, right? I think that's where we always need to go, or at least that's where, where I go is, you know, let's look at the impact of public higher education. Let's look at what has transpired. Let's look at what happens when we put money into programs and initiatives that we know work. Let's look at how we can decrease equity gaps, right? Let's look at how public higher education can stop the vicious cycle of social reproduction and actually lead towards social mobility, right? So when I'm faced with that question, and I identify question, you know, opportunities, whether it's, you know, national models as far as, you know, guided pathways, which I know is embraced at Montgomery College, um, whether it's, um, you know, looking at intrusive advising, you know, all of these opportunities um, that we see that we know help students that we're embracing and including into public higher education, I share those with, with individuals and I say, okay, now let's have a conversation about how much public higher education is a, is a public good and the benefit that it has for our society. So. Thank you for that. So, you know, you, you heard me talk a little bit in the remarks about just the, the monumental change that has occurred as a result of the pandemic. Yes. And yet every day we're still trying to figure out, um, you know, how we embrace change and within and with the constructs of embracing change, how do we ensure that we're we're listening to yeah. and responding to the needs of our colleagues here at Montgomery College and the needs of students? So have you seen any changes in higher education as a result of the last 20 plus months that we've gone through that could have positive long term impact? Yes, and I'm, I'm, I'm smiling because I know um, what we've all experienced collectively as, as a group and, and just reflecting on so many of the pivots and transitions that we've, we've had to make and the changes. And we think about, you know, probably one of the, the ones that comes to mind the, the quickest is, you know, support from a distance and, and student success, right? And I'd say support from a distance in terms of virtually supporting students, faculty, staff, and in our community. We had to learn how to do that very quickly, uh, most of us in March of 2020, when it was kind of full stop, everything is virtual. And then as we've lived in this virtual world, and to your point, we've been able to adjust, we've figured out, okay, so what's most beneficial, you know, via this virtual? What's most beneficial, beneficial via hybrid, right? How are we best meeting the needs of students. And I think that's kind of the crux of, kind of my first part of the answer is we've identified how we're best meeting the needs of students and how we're really looking at equity. And I think that's um, one of the pieces, another piece that the pandemic has helped us in terms of it has really illuminated um, disparities. And I think for, for those of us who have been very immersed in, you know, in radical inclusion and anti-racist work and racial equity, we, we've seen those. And um, one of the positive outcomes of this pandemic is that I think it's been further illuminated to others who, who have not. And I, I'm hopeful that that will continue. That very kind of um, analytic approach to identifying basically unmet student needs, right? It, it, it really dovetails with you know, what Montgomery College does in terms of how identifying unmet student needs. And I think that is a positive that has come from the pandemic that I hope stays, is that we're able to critically analyze what those unmet student needs are and, and move forward, so. Thank you for that. And then I will say that um, I do have a last question. Sure. I'm, I'm sure that as you begin your uh, journey here at Montgomery College, there'll be many opportunities for you in, to engage both internally and externally across all um, you know, the constituencies and all of our more than 3,000 employees and uh, more than 1 million residents. But I would say, is there anything that you think that Montgomery College and the greater community should know about you that hasn't been shared? Wow, uh, well there is, I realize that I have a lot to learn 
I'd be repetitive. I would say, one, I'm extremely excited to, to be here and so thankful to the board of trustees and, and everyone from the community who's been so welcoming. I look forward to meeting so many individuals. Um, I truly uh, want to embrace everything that I have to learn, and I want to do that in full partnership with everyone. So it's more of a, um, uh, a further emphasis on the fact that I look forward to you know, partnering with everyone, you know, listening, collaborating, seeing um, not only the successes that have occurred at Montgomery College, because there have been so many, but figuring out how do we elevate those successes, right? How do we take Montgomery College to the next level? Um, because I know through partnership, um, we can do that. And that's what I'm looking forward to, is that level of partnership so that we can really just go into the future together. Well, I will say one thing and then end uh, this conversation today. Uh, we know that purple has become your favorite color uh, <laughs> and uh, always want to keep that in mind. And uh, what I will say is that, you know, I've been a, 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 a longtime partner with uh, Montgomery College and so many things over um, the last 25 years of my work here in the state of Maryland. So one thing I can do is while I've looked and admired from afar, I have had the experience of it being up close and personal for these last months, and you are coming to a phenomenal institution just filled with dedicated, creative uh, faculty, staff, and administrators. So welcome to Montgomery College, and uh, I know that you will do great things. Thank you so much for this conversation, Dr. Williams. Thank you, Dr. Dukes. Good morning, colleagues. I'm Dr. Sanjay Rai, Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. I'm honored to be with you this morning and very, very pleased to welcome you to spring 2022 semester. Montgomery College faculty continue to be strong and committed to student success, building relationship with the students, engaging thoughtfully and compassionately, and providing stimulating and innovative pedagogy based on national best practices throughout this, this pandemic. Our students are the reason why we do what we do. We have responded to pandemic by providing additional resources, additional scheduling flexibility, additional academic support services to meet myriad needs of our students. I'm extremely proud of our faculty and our students and look forward to hearing from them today. We are sharing just two examples this morning with you from so many to choose from. These are two examples that show why Montgomery College is one of the best community college in the nation. You will hear from a faculty and students from a STEM program or biotechnology program and from an arts program or music program. I thank you for all that you do to support our students, and I wish you a very successful semester. Now I welcome Dr. Laurie Kelman to the podium. Good morning. The biotechnology sector is very strong, and local companies have hundreds of open positions. The MC Biotech program prepares students for these local jobs, including manufacturing COVID-19 vaccines and test kits. I'm here to tell you briefly about a new opportunity for biotech students to gain industry experience and complete their, educational, uh, their education at the same time. GlaxoSmithKline, a global pharmaceutical firm whose worldwide vaccine research center is located here in Montgomery County, offers apprenticeships for biotech students. Each apprentice is a full-time employee and GSK pays their educational expenses and gives them time off from work to complete classes. Apprentices earn a full-time salary while they gain experience and will earn their degree debt-free. GSK has a great support system of mentors, including other US and international apprentices. I'm pleased to welcome one of our GSK biotech apprentices, William Zochoa, to say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Kelman. The program is an excellent opportunity when I and 14 other U.S. apprentices can earn leading industry training and experience. Across the world, 
there are hundreds of GlaxoSmithKline apprentices. In Maryland, GSK has partnered with MC to provide the educational aspect of the apprenticeship. I am very pleased that the skills and knowledge I am learning at MC seamlessly translates to my everyday work. MC Biotech's similar equipment, vendors, and environment are some highlights that make the transition from school to the workplace much easier. The students in the biotech program also recognize the tremendous efforts by professors and the college to be able to have classes in person. When we needed them the most during remote learning, they rose to the challenge. I would also like to highlight the amazing professors that we have available to students. Just to name a few, Professors Kelman, Jones, and Tanjirala are all industry experts whose selflessness in sharing their experience and knowledge excels beyond what I could imagine. Many thanks to GlaxoSmithKline, and thank you for an opportunity to be part of the program today. Now, I would like to welcome Professor Alvin Trask to the podium. Thank you, William. I'm Alvin Trask, Professor of Music and Chair of the Performing Arts Department, and I would like to share information about the Performing Arts Department at MC. The Performing Arts Department consists of dance, music, and theater, and we offer courses that are very specific to each program and major, but in addition, we offer a variety of introductory and general education courses so that our wider population of students can access the arts as part of their educational and co-curricular experience. A performing arts student's experience at MC can incorporate a diverse palette of opportunities to be on stage in front of an audience, as well as taking opportunities to work backstage in technical production. During the pandemic, our department was challenged to deliver courses remotely, produce shows and performances through Zoom. Our faculty learned and implemented numerous new ideas that were that we that we incorporated and will continue to incorporate as we move back to face-to-face -face learning. We are now able to stream performances while continuing to have live audiences. This gives us an opportunity co to connect more with our patrons and the wider MC community. We had our first theater and dance shows fully produced on Zoom. MC was one of the first to produce and perform shows on Zoom even before the four year, other four-year and two-year institutions in the area. I would also like to acknowledge our great faculty and staff artists who continue to be current in their disciplines and remain active as performers and producers in the arts. This becomes a huge asset for our students to have an opportunity to study with the best. I would like to leave you with a final thought about the arts taken from a speech made by Gordon M. Ambach, Executive Director, the Council of the Chief of State School Officers. The importance of the arts in education flows from the power of the arts that we feel in each of our lives. The arts enable us to be creative, to express our emotions, and to develop our self-discipline. The arts helps us display our unique characteristics and our diversity, as well as to show our commonalities as a culture and nation. Every child in our nation must have the opportunity to draw, to paint, to sculpt and construct, to sing and play instruments, to dance and perform dramatically, and to create artistically through technologies. Thank you. Now let's hear from our student, Andrew Anthony. Thank you, Professor Trask. Hi, my name is Andrew Anthony, and I'm currently working on my Associates of Arts degree as a performing violinist here at MC. I have, played the, I have played the violin for about 12 years now, and I'm looking into expanding my skills as a musician and dive into music production and composition. I started full-time at MC in fall 2020, so I've pretty much been remote since. Considering the pandemic, I have enjoyed and am pleased with the courses I've taken virtually, especially with the music courses I've taken. I've learned many skills that I've been wanting to know. The general education courses do help me in my music and my current job as well. I work at, class, I work at a classical string res restoration store in Old Town Gaithersburg, Lashoff Violins. Previous math and science courses I've taken 
have helped in learning the craftsmanship of violins and other instruments. I've been really lucky to still be doing gigs and other performances both inside and outside of MC, allowing me to continue to do what I love and get my music exposed. Music has really taken over my life and I'm happy it did. Even being almost two years into a pandemic, music has kept me and my other friends going. I've enjoyed my experience at MC and the music program and look forward to having my last semester be my first in-person semester. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Monica Brown, the Senior Vice President of Student Affairs. Thank you very much. Greetings. I hope you had an enjoyable winter break. I cannot believe that we are already at the start of the spring semester. Before you know it, we'll be preparing for our end of the year, um, end of the semester events and celebrations. But before we do that, I look forward to welcoming students back next week. However, this would not be possible without the dedicated faculty, staff, and administrators who have worked tirelessly to help new and returning students through the enrollment process. Thank you for your continued support of our students. I am excited to introduce some of the dedicated staff who work closely with and on behalf of students. From the Division of Student Affairs, please join me in welcoming our athletic director, Tarlo Gasque, head women's volleyball coach, Victoria Kino, and head coach, Pedro Braz, to showcase our athletic championship teams. Go Raptors! And they will be followed by Dr. Carmen Poston Farmas Travis and one of our outstanding students, Thaddeus Gross, to share information about the Presidential Scholars Program. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Good morning. We're very proud of all our Montgomery College student athletes and especially our winning teams. We recently joined the ranks of Division I and II, and to have excelled at this level so quickly demonstrates what a talented group of players and coaches exists at Montgomery College. I'm expecting great things from our other sports teams as well. Men and women's basketball started competition in November and will continue the winning tradition this spring. Men's baseball, women's softball, and men and women's track and field just started practices and are looking forward to competing this spring. Now I'd like to introduce Victoria Keno, a former MC student athlete and now head coach of women's volleyball team. Thank you, Coach G. The athletics department is so excited and honored to be here with you all today. This season, the women's volleyball team won the Region 20 tournament, the Mid-Atlantic District tournament, and made an appearance at the national tournament in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I would like to introduce one of my players from the volleyball team that played a part in our success this season. To my left is freshman outside hitter Sydney Babb. Sydney was Region 20 Player of the Month of September and October, and was also Maryland Juco Player of the Month of October. Sydney was named first team all Region 20 along with sophomore setter Kira Ng and freshman opposite Jalen Jackson was named honorable mention for Region 20. These are just a few of the Raptors accomplishments this season. Now I'd like to introduce Pedro Braz, coach of the men's and women's soccer team. Well, <clears throat> good morning and thanks coach. Um, I'm here representing both men and women's soccer programs. For just the first, the second time in school history, um, both men's and women's soccer team won Region 20 championships in the same season. The championships represent both programs, first time becoming a Division I program. <clears throat> On the men's side, uh, we secured the first Region 20 championship since 2015. Um, the, the men finished the season with 13 and five record. It also finished a runner up in the Eastern District Finals. The team ended the regular season as ranked the number 16 team in the country. Our Venezuelan attacking center midfielder, Andres Javits, finished third in goals in the country and was named third team NJCAA All-American. 
which is, again, the first as a Division I program. I'd like to introduce one of my players uh, on the men's soccer team. You see him here to my left, sophomore captain Keno Thompson, which he started 31 games over his career at MC, a former U-17 Jamaican national team player. Keno led the defense this season. He's on track to graduate this spring in an engineering degree and is currently evaluating programs to continue his college career. <clears throat> Keno was named all Region 20 first team. We're proud of our growth for both soccer programs, okay, and honored to represent MC as his first two Division I programs. So thanks, Keno. Now bringing up two women's soccer student athletes. Women's soccer after a change of coaching staff, the women's team stepped up and finished the season with seven wins in the last nine games, claiming the regional championship and finishing one game short of the national championship appearance. I'd like to introduce two of our players from the women's soccer team. First one is freshman Luisa Navis Gonzalez, who scored 16 goals in 13 games, including the goal that won the regional championship. Luisa is a winger from Lanham, Maryland, and received uh, an honorable mention in, as a NJCAA All-American, once again, the first Raptor to be named as a Division I player. I'd also like to introduce Natalie Mijaya, a sophomore central midfielder from Silver Spring. As a centerpiece of our midfield, Natalie scored four goals and six assists. She was named to the all-region 20 team and was vital to the team's success. We expect to see both of them back on the field for the Raptors next season. And now I would like to introduce Dr. Carmen Poston Farmer Travis. Thank you, Pedro. I am Carmen, the Director of Student Affairs, and it is my great pleasure to share the what, the why, the how, and the when relative to the Presidential Scholars Program. PSP, the Presidential Scholars Program, is a priority initiative at the college. It is designed to increase completion of degrees and professional certificates and increase the representation of African-American men in careers in industries with life-sustaining salaries by connecting students to employers and mentors from the industry. It is also designed to clearly demonstrate intention and solutions toward addressing systemic racism and other barriers to success. Why PSP? National, state, local, and MC data are clear indicators for why this program is essential. Students struggle to graduate and often do not reach their academic goals and graduate at much lower rates. Their median income is of the lowest and their poverty rates, unfortunately, is at the highest. But let's hear from a student's perspective as to why this initiatives and others are necessary. Let's come from, you know, single, single mother households or, you know, we don't have that mentor to guide us. So it was really impactful to me personally because uh, both of my parents didn't go to college, so I'm first generation. And I feel like it really touched me in a way where I can make some transitions and to move forward throughout my career or life. So how do we plan to meet these goals? Well, we're going to meet them because, as I shared earlier, students struggle to graduate. They do not reach their academic goals. Their GPAs are sometimes at the lowest and degree uh, attainment is low as well as their income and their poverty le level. But how do we plan to do this? 
The approach to accomplishing the PSP goals aligns very well with the highly regarded Maslow's hierarchy of needs. PSP considers four key fundamental and foundational interventions that are proven best practices for success. Financial aid and basic need supports, academic and student support services, mentorship and success coaching, and experimental learning and opportunities. You should also know that through internal and external relationships and partnerships, we will create resources. So when, we, when would this happen? PSP launches pilot this spring. The website and promotional materials have been developed. Informational sessions were held and recruitment is on the way for more students and also mentors. The pilot will serve a maximum of 30 students for this semester. And thus far, there is about one third of the program cap for students accepted into the inaugural program. So we're excited about that. But at this time, I would like to bring up Thaddeus Gross, PSP first applicant, first scholar, and first acceptance. Thank you, Dr. Carmen. Hi, my name is Thaddeus DeGross, and I am a student at the Tacoma Park Silver Spring Campus. My major is fine arts, with the goal of one day being an art director. I am truly grateful for this program and excited when asked about my thoughts and commitment to this program, this is what I shared. To put it bluntly, I'll be committed to this program not only because I believe that the furthering of the African American community requires targeted assistance, but also because I need the assistance that the Presidential Scholars Program is offering. Since I've graduated high school, I've wanted nothing more than to become one of the first men in my family to get a college degree, but I've had every attempt met with the choice between this goal or my financial well-being. It would mean a great deal to me to be a part of this pilot program to help pioneer an educational and economic path for myself and others, particularly for us African Americans who pursue the creative arts. To recap, here is another video as to why the Presidential Scholars Program is important, and this video was captured at its exception. Presidential Scholars Program is so important because one of the main reasons that students don't finish or complete their time at MC because of a lack of connection to the college or not feeling as if they're a part of a community. And so this would give us an opportunity to really support them from start to finish in whatever decisions they're making to help them have mentorship, to provide supports for themselves um, financially and academically. So they really become a part of a community and by being a president of scholar, they create their own community within the larger MC body. Receiving a Montgomery College Foundation scholarship has benefited me as a student returning back to school because it allows me to give more time and put more energy into my studies, thus making for a more fulfilled and more productive student experience. The Presidential Scholars Program will benefit students as it will give them an enhanced level of confidence knowing that their ambitions and their academic performance has been appropriately recognized and rewarded. The Presidential Scholars Program will make a great impact on this community for years to come, not only from the standpoint of uh, trained workforce for the business community. You'll have a better standard of living for the community as a whole. And uh, certainly uh, the business community and the community at large will uh, benefit uh, from a better educated workforce and a better standard of living for the entire community. That's what we need here in Montgomery County. All good things, including opening meetings, must come to an end. On behalf of the Vice Presidents and Provosts, Dr. Dukes, our Interim President, the faculty, staff, and administrators, and as we anticipate the start of the Lunar New Year in 10 days, the Year of the Tiger, we wish each and every Montgomery College student the power, bravery, and courage of the Tiger to have a very successful semester. Please refer to the Spring Meeting website for additional information. Thank you, have a great semester.